Okay. Um, um, good morning. Good morning. It's somewhere it's good morning. <laughs> So, from um, I wish there were people here, but things in the theater and stuff. Um, and there are some people online, and they are recording. So, we can well, it's going to show you workshop night. Uh, if you can make sure your cell phone for our library, that'd be great. Make sure that we can do with the meeting. Um, if you haven't removed your membership, please go ahead and do that so you can enter our competition next month. And uh, if you haven't been to the fair yet, you can check out the Tabaki exhibit. Please do that. There's lots of really great pictures to look at uh, and a bunch of other stuff there too. Um, if you are a volunteer and you benefit your ticket, please let me or Chris know uh, because for every four hours that you volunteer, you get two tickets and a customer pass. So um, if you haven't gotten that yet, please let Chris know and we can get those to you. Um, also, continue to think about and pray for Richard Wood, who is slowly getting better. Uh, he is having such dizziness when he walks. Um, and he's recovering his speech slowly but surely, but it's not as fast as he would. <laughs> um, if you know what that's really. Um, um, on all uh, uh, next month is very busy month. We have lots of things happening, and so I'll just remind you what's happening on October. Um, on October 14th, well, on October 11th is the deadline for our craft competition. So the competition is on October 18th, but get your pictures in by the 11th. And um, that's on the website. It's up. The entries are there. I haven't posted uh, tomorrow. I'm sending the article to the website, so that'll be up tomorrow. Um, then on the 14th, uh, Kathy and Jerry Ben are making a workshop on learning the magic of subtractive photography or subtractive life. Um, and learn how Jerry creates his award-winning natural light for reading the camera. Sorry, that's the feedback. Um, and there's a sign up on the website so that we can have an idea of how many people are coming. It's from 4 to 6 in the evening on October 14th, and um, he is uh, we're going to be meeting at the um, where? I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Somebody field trip, and uh, then on October 25th, we have Matt Cohn is coming to talk about how to create a photo book, how to pick, you know, the best flow of your pictures, and how to look at the pictures and include things like that. Um, and then Kathy, yes, this is Stacy. We're having uh, trouble on the the Zoom people. Uh, you're breaking in and out and echoing, so didn't catch that little last part. Um, I guess, I guess I'll here. Uh, uh, on, on, are you talking, are you talking about, about that Cohen talking, talking, talking about, about photo, photo books? books? We're doing yeah. that. And then, and then on the 29th, we have a field trip day, day of the dead down at Hollywood Forever Cemetery. So it's a busy month, lots, lots to do, lots, lots to, to pick from. from. Um, um, I'm up next. Also, do <laughs> you want to talk about um, The SPC competitions are open now. now. The October competition closes on October 8th. And, and that has 10, 10 different classes, classes you can enter in, uh, and, and it's free. It's free. It's free. There, you there you go. Also, also the, the S4C International, International Exhibition is open, and it closes on November 9th, or November, or November, 4th. November 4th. Um, um, and, and I, I 
put the, put website, the website in the email. So we'll check, check your emails. emails. Um, and then PSA members, creative and portrait deadlines are November 1st. So, so be thinking about, about all that stuff. stuff. Yeah. Okay. If you need help getting your UEN, which is Universal Entry, Entry Number, Entry number uh, uh, please, please talk, talk with Anne. Anne. She'd, She'd be glad, glad to help, to help you figure that out. That out. Yeah. yeah. Um, we'll be good. Oh. Because you need those to enter, enter the S4C competition. competition. Okay, okay, so, so tonight, tonight, we have John Howard. I'll give you John Howard. I'll give you John Howard. Well, if you know Joe, John, John used Japan as his base for six years for his travel photography throughout Southeast Asia, focusing on such places as India, Myanmar, Burma, the Philippines, China, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and of course Japan. Returning to the USA just over three years ago, John will continue his travel photography in Asia once you go north next month. Next month. So it's once the pandemic complies. So in the meantime, he's been focusing on re local reenactment events, capturing reenactors in our case type effects. As for photographic highlights, he was awarded photographer of the year. From the professional photographers of Hawaii several times and from the professional photographers of Los Angeles County. John had his first book published just prior to the pandemic entitled Vietnam Today A Photographic Book of Peoples and Landscapes. He holds a Master of Photography degree from PPA as well as a certified professional photographer. Okay. Um, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to him. And, and um, Kathy, yes, yes, there's a horrible echo now. Let's see if it continues to come talk. Okay, I'm gonna mute mine and he's gonna take over and we'll see if that fixes it. <clears throat> okay, testing one, two. Can you hear me? Okay, is that better? Okay, great. All right, it's a pleasure to be here again. Um, I noticed you had mentioned the Day of the Dead on October 29th. I'm at professional photographers of Los Angeles County. We're also going that day on the 29th. We go every year. It was funny, I went last year, took some photos, and I saw Kathy's photos, Tom's photos, and I'm going, they took my photos. <laughs> we were there on the same day, obviously, last year, and we were shooting the same subjects. So uh, we'll be doing that, but this time I'll be looking for you. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we, we're, we're scheduled to be there. I've got my ticket already. Yeah. Uh, we, we've been publicizing it for the last week or so. So uh, it's well worth going to. Um, and yeah, I'm going back to Japan next. Borders open up on October 11th. I'm gonna be in Iceland again, photographing at that time. So I've got tickets on November 20th. I fly back to Japan and I'll be there for a week and a half and then have to stop in Honolulu for a professional, a professional photographers of Hawaii meeting. Uh, and then I'll be back here anyway. So yeah, with that open, I'm, I'm back on the, on the road again. Uh, and you can't, Jerry, can you see me? Okay. Okay. And all you're good back. Okay. Uh, it might be better if I'm like this, uh, it's a much better view. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm going to be sharing over the next five hours with you. Um, uh oh, uh oh, no, uh, no, that's a joke for the mountain in uh, Zoom land. Um, um, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to give you a little background on black and white photography, a little history, and, and then I'm going to take you into how I do uh, my reenactment photos to make them look kind of old and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and if you have any questions as we're going along please feel free to interrupt what you're looking up at right now on the screen is the first photo in existence this photo was taken in 1826 by joseph nipsey of, of france um and the, the exposure i understand was something like 20 to 30 minutes for this exposure uh this is the very first photo and these are all black and white Here's the oldest, I can never pronounce this, I apologize, 
daguerreotype um, coming up here. There we go. This is the oldest daguerreotype taken by Louis uh, de Guerre. And this was taken in 1838. And I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but down in the left-hand corner, you see this gentleman standing there with his foot up. That's the first photo of a human being. Huh. Now we live in the world today of the iPhone or cell phone, right? You know, right here, the cell phone. We live by the cell phone. Some young kids die by the cell phone. And of course, the number one thing that people take with the cell phone is what? Selfies. selfies. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the very first selfie. This was taken in 1839. It's the first portrait. It was done by Robert Cornelius, and it is a picture of himself. He had like to stand. I'm sorry. Looks like Robert Conrad. You know, you're right. It does look a little bit like Robert Conrad. Uh, but as I said, this was taken in 1839, and Bob Conrad would be pretty old by now. <laughs> uh, but yes, that was that's the very first portrait. And it's also the very first selfie, uh, just for fun. Here in 1843, this is the oldest photo of a president. This is John Quincy Adams. This was taken 14 years after his presidency when he was 75, again, in 1843. This is the first photo of a US president. Um, and then the next year, Louis de Guerre, de Guerre, I know I'm mispronouncing it, I apologize. De, de Guerre. De Guerre, thank you. This is Louis de, de Guerre. He had set this up and had this photo taken of himself. Um, then during the, and I'm sharing these so that you get a feel of what photos looked like 150 years ago. Here are several uh, Civil War photos. Notice the yellow tinting on them. And then here's some Civil War photos taken at the same time period, but notice the sepia tones to them. And then a few that are just straight black and white. And then finally here are uh, uh, some uh, civilians. Notice, look how, although the, the images themselves are all scratched, look how sharp and, and clear the, uh, the photos are themselves. Very, very pristine. And then here's one of Mr. Abraham Lincoln himself, black and white. I'm not sure if this was Matthew Brady or not. Um, Matthew Brady, of course, most of you know, took photos during the Civil War. Uh, it, it's amazing. Most of the photos that were used uh, during the Civil War, like this one, are tin types, patent, patented in 1856, which is a thin tin plate, uh, but used, it was used because it was easier to preserve them. And after the war, there were thousands of, of photos taken of tin types by Matthew Brady and other photographers. And what happened, people thought they were useless. And then what they did is since they were literally panes of glass, they took them and, and, and uh, the greenhouses throughout Virginia and Pennsylvania, they put them up as plates of glass in the greenhouses. And that's where, you, that's where they all went to. Hmm. They, they all, that's why there's very few, although tens of thousands of photos were taken, less than a thousand are around today. The rest were just thrown out because they were glass or used in greenhouses and other places as plates of windows. Uh, and up into, the, up into the early 20th century, people were still finding photos in the greenhouses and taking them out and for trying, trying to preserve them. Uh, little trivia for that. No charge for that info, that was free. Uh, you know, real quickly, how I got involved and started to doing black and white. Here's my journey real quick. As has been mentioned before by Kathy, uh, I lived in Japan for 16 years, and I've, I've photographed all over Japan. But one thing that I really enjoy doing is on Sunday afternoons, there's a certain park in downtown Tokyo at 2 o'clock 
where these rock and roll gang or rockabillies are called would hang out and dance. They've got the hair like this and so forth. And on Sunday afternoons, I would go and photograph them. And these are some of the photos that I took about 10 years ago or so. Uh, they would sit there and they would, again, they would mimic the 50, they'd have um, the um, boom boxes and they'd have rock and roll music playing and they would be dancing out in the park there in one particular area. Something you just don't associate with Japan, okay? But I enjoy taking these photos uh, and it dawned on me one time, uh, you know, <laughs> this is, I'm going, you know, these guys are mimicking the 50s. So if I'm going to take photos like this, why not try to capture it as it was in the 50s? And this is what started me on my journey. And this was my first black and white photo as I was moving into getting them to look old. And I'll show you as I worked on them. These are I, I, what I first started doing was taking the photos black and white, and then I throw in a little color here and there if it was there. But you get the idea of what I was doing um, about 10 years ago. So these are the photos that I took. And then what I did is I came back to the States about three and a half years ago. And, and with the, when the pandemic hit, I couldn't go back to Japan. I couldn't go back to India. I couldn't go back to Vietnam or any of those countries. So I said, you know what? I can't just put down my camera. I need to photograph something. And I was thinking of the old, what is, and then I came across this uh, reenactment. This was in Dominguez Hills. Uh, and I took the photo and I said, you know what? I can, I can take photos uh, of the reenactments here and, and play with them on black and white or make them sepia a little bit. And then I said, you know what? Why don't I start putting a little texture on them? And then this was in Huntington Beach a couple of years uh, ago. Um, they, after the pandemic calmed down a little bit, I put the texture on this one. This was a guy named Ben Franklin. And I said, oh, I kind of like that. And then I said, you know what? If I can do that with the sepia, why not with the black and white? And I got myself... Uh, a little texture thing and I and I put it on here and then this was my first black and white textured image taken from from that time period and then I went up to Ukaipa where uh, they were doing the Revolutionary War reenactment and it was raining but I was able to capture this photo of George Washington and I and I although they didn't have cameras back in 1776 I wanted to give it a feel like Wow, if they did, this is what it probably would look like. It's, it's what you would call artistic license and artistic freedom. And when you apply those words to it, you can do anything you want. So uh, this, is, this is what I started doing. And I, I, I just, this is great. Something to do during, uh, while I'm stuck here in the States. And like I shared with you, some of the Civil War photos that were yellow tinted. So I put some yellow tinting on, on some, and I put some other tinting on others. And, and then here I combined the texturing with the sepia. And, and this is pretty much what I came up with. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, okay, let me get out of there. Now, what you want to know about, okay, that, that gives you the journey of black and white where it came from and how I got involved and in, got to this point here. Now, I know what a lot of you want to know is how in the world do I do the things that I do? I'm going to share with you uh, the, the key. There's one key to all of this. And you're going to have to forgive me because I have to uh, unshare my screen and then reshare it again because I have I, one thing in Zoom, you can't just go from screen to screen. So I have to unshare here for a second. Okay. And I'm going to, I want to share just my, uh, how do I do this now? Okay, let's see here. <clears throat> go to the bottom, I think. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> let's see, I'm going to unshare. Let me go here and put that down. Okay, let me get out of here. All right, now, 
I want to share my, uh, I tell you what, I'm just going to pull up. You're still sharing your screen, so Great. it's okay. fine. <laughs> okay. Do whatever you like. <laughs> what I want to do is share Photoshop now. Yes. Okay. Uh, let me pull. Can you see? Yeah, good. You can see that. I'm going to pull one photo. We'll start with this one here. Okay, those in Zoom land, can you see this gentleman? Great, okay, good. Okay, what I'm gonna do is share with you, uh, what I'm gonna do is, I, this is a photo I took, I'm gonna be sharing with you some photos that I took earlier this month. These are Civil War reenactment at Huntington Beach that was earlier this month, uh, September 3rd or 4th. Uh, these are some of the photos that I took. And so what I do, for instance, is like, here's one photo. I'm, again, this is personal taste, personal choice. You know, I take pictures of a lot of different individuals, but what automatically gets my attention in, in these reenactments is if they're wearing a hat and if they got a beard, I'm putting those two together and my camera goes right there automatically. And, uh, you know, I, and I'll take several photos, okay? Again, we're up to our own personal tastes and choices on things. I sometimes like a head-on shot. Uh, most of the times I want a candid shot. I will tell them, don't look at me, look this way, look to the right, look to the left, but don't look at me, okay? And some, this guy just kind of looked right at me and I said, well, you know what? It's got a grizzled old look. I'll just take the photo anyway. And I kind of liked it. So uh, I'm going to walk you through with what I do to make this look like a uh, old time tinted uh, photo. First thing that I do is, um, is I resize it. I make sure, let's see what size I've got here. Uh, I, yeah, my, it's mine in, in this case is 12 by eights. Um, I'm shooting with the Canon R5. Uh, I love the Canon R5, uh, but the, the, the the pictures, they come out and, and they're, they're like 40 megabytes, okay? They're, they're big. And this is a, for those in Zoom land who can't see this, I'm using a 21 inch Mac computer. It has no memory. It is, it's a weak. I, I had the 27 inch with the two terabyte. I could do all kinds of stuff with it. This replacement is not, not good. I'm waiting for Apple to, hopefully come back out with the 27 in the next year or two and get those terabytes up. So anyway, what I do is I, I downsize this to a 12 by eight to work with so that it's uh, more pliable here on this particular computer. Anyway, so this is already sized. It's a JPEG. I shoot in raw, by the way, but uh, uh, just to make things quick, the first thing that I do when I'm, when I'm working, my, my workflow is uh, when I'm working here is first thing I do is I am working, I work in cam, I start in camera raw uh, is the first thing that I do. And when I'm in camera raw, uh, I'm, I'm usually my temperature and text tint are pretty good. I make sure that the exposure is okay. I play around with the basics and that's why it's called the basics. And I just kind of, play around with it, just make sure things are sharp. I want to bring in the background a little with the highlights, Hi the shadows, I want to get the details in here. I make sure the texture, I kick up the texture and clarity to bring out some of the clothing and some of the skin there. Uh, just the basics right there. And once once <coughs> I've done that. <clears throat> Helen asked if uh, you do use the 70 to 200. That. Yes, thank you. Uh, my bread and butter is the 2.870 to 200. Um, I, that that for portrait photography, that that's right in that range there. And the 2.8 gives you all the light that you can possibly muster, especially during the daylight. A 100 ISO. Uh, yeah, that's 70 to 200. In fact, every photo here that I'm sharing is 70 to 200. My bread, as I said, it's my bread and butter. That's on my. If I take that off, it's got to be something exceptional coming up. So, uh, yeah, good question. Thank you. So I hit OK on that. 
And that takes me back into um, Photoshop. First thing that I do is I go into adjustments and, uh, and what I do, oh, what I like to do is make sure that the eyes are sharp. Um, over on the right, something that I like to have is Navigator. I love Navigator. That way I can bring in and bring out the size of photos so easy that way. I'm zooming in and out all the time. And what I'm looking at, first thing I look at is the eyes. I make sure that, um, that the opacity on that, what I do is I, I go on here and I'm in the dodge tool and I just kind of click to make sure that things are looking good there. They're pretty much looking good as it is. Um, yeah, I, that's fine for this particular one. So the eyes are good, they're sharp. I look to make sure things look relatively sharp and that's good. So then I'll come back out. Everything kind of looks good. What I'll do, this is just me. And the, the, my workflow is pretty simple. I'll go to black and white. And uh, what I'll do is I'll just play around a little bit, bring out the, the face a little, uh, bring the background, get some definition back there. Each photo is different. You just each, and I, I, make, I make sure it's on the light side. I don't go on the dark side. I'll explain why in a minute. I keep things on the light side uh, on all my images. And once I got where I want, then I click an OK there. I then come back, and this is where I go to exposure. And this is, again, personal preference. I kick the exposure up just a tad. The offset, if you move to the left, brings out and enriches the black and whites. And that's too far, of course, but I'm just showing. What I do is I just pinch that a little bit. And then I bring the gamma in to the right a little. And look at that definition there. Uh, that it brings out that, that texture so nice when you compare it to before. Here's, here's the before and then here's after. Um, the, there's the normal black and white. And then I just punch it a little to bring out that rich tone and texture. Uh, on the image there. So now, you, yeah, you used a black, the black and white. Yes. In, rather than a layer. You can do. You can do a layer way. if you want. Uh, what I what I do, you know, one thing. What I do at this point is I save things uh, as I build them. Um, I don't use a layer at this point because what I do now, once I have done this, I save this. It's already saved as civil, the Civil War 4127. What I do now, and I'm just I'll put on my desktop there, I then put on here, BW for black white. Okay. Okay, and I save that. So just in case I ever have to go back and I wanna change it back, I just go back to that one. I save a whole bunch of these that you're gonna see in a few moments here. Um, so once I've done that, this looks, this looks pretty good. Now, here's where the trick comes in for the old, old look. I have this one, I play with this one texture all the time. Let me get this out of the way. I've got the zoom people in the... Oh, in your way? That's okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah, just move them out of the way. You should be able to... Reduce it down to just no nobody. No, wait a minute. Where's where's my face? What happened to my? Okay, there we go. All right. Let me move this in a little bit. There we go. What I do is I bring in this texture right here. This is my bread and butter texture. I use this on all of them. This is a texture that I had picked up years ago. This baby is on all my images. Now, what I will do sometimes is, uh, man, T, um, let me capture it. Oh man, T. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll turn it around 
or turn it like this or whatever, so that you don't get the same markings on every image. But this is my, this is my bread and butter one here. I, I, this one I use and I copy it, then you can slide it and put it over. I just do it the old fashioned way. What I do is I just put that right on top of there. I put command T to transform. I hold down the shift to make sure I capture all of it because it's real important. Blow it up a little so you can see. Notice on this texture, you see all these details. I love all these stains and everything on here. Uh, I just like to capture all of that. Uh, so I have that as a layer up there. And then what I do is I put a mask on there. Then what I do is I bring, this is real simple. It's real simple. This is- so Can you tell people how you put a mask on there? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No, I'm just, because yeah, some yeah. people are familiar with Photoshop yeah, and other okay, people back. Okay. are like, what? Yeah. How did you do that? Okay. So thank you. Sorry. No, 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 that's good stuff. What I do is I have this one texture and what I do is I bring it into Photoshop here. Let me, let me grab it and bring it into Photoshop. Now you can just, what I do is, is Command A to capture it, Command C to copy it. Then I go over to the Civil War photo and do Command B and it pastes right on top. It's now a layer on top of my photo. Here's my photo, and now here's the texture on top of it. So now you can't see the image. You cannot see this image because the texture is on top of it. Um, that's the layer there. So what I do is I come down here to this little camera thing here, and it's called the uh, layer mask, and I click it. I'm on this texture box and I click on there and I bring that mask, it's called right there, right up in there. Now, then I go to my brush tool. Over here, I go to my brush tool. I make sure that it's on black. Black reveals white hides. So I'm going to erase some of this because it's on black. I keep my opacity in this case, around 30%. But what I do, instead of going blind, where, where's the image? You know, where, where, where's the image at? What I do is I go over to the opacity here and I lower the opacity so you can start to see where it's at. And once I know right where it's at, the image below it, I go, okay, now I know where I need to go to reveal the, uh, the, the, the image. So then I come on over, I make sure that I'm on black, I'm at about 30%, and then I, I always start with the face. That's me, I just start with the face. I always make sure I capture the face, and then I kind of move up and get the hat, and I come down and I get the beard, and I'm clicking all the time, revealing little bits. I don't wanna reveal too much, but you want to keep some of that texture. So once I've done some of that, I go back to the opacity and I kick it back up again. See there, now I know where everything's at. This way, you see when I have the opacity down, you can't see that texture too much. But if I bring the opacity up, you begin to see that texture again and you're starting to lose the image. And that's where you come back in and you make sure you click on some more of it. And as I said, I'm at 30. Sometimes that's too strong. Like for instance, sometimes if you're up like at 50, it's just like, whoa, that's overwhelming. So I keep it, sometimes I'll go down for the body, 19% or something. Now I'm working on it, I'm working on it. Uh oh, that's, that's too bright. Okay, that, that's too bright. So what you do, since black reveals, just bring out the white. And what the white does, and I just bring that back up, it brings it back. There you go. Now, sometimes you're working, you're working, you're working, and you're going, oh my goodness. Oh, it's all outside the, outside the figure. 
That's the, you know, no, you don't want that. That's why you go back here. And I bring the opacity up to about 40 or so. And I bring down the size of my brush and I paint back in around. And I just bring back that image, the, the textures in that image. So that it's not a halo effect. So if you got an image like this. Now, there you go, and you go like, okay, is that what you want? Is that what I'm looking for? Yes. Is the beard too? Oops, I don't want to do that. Let's go back. Let's go back here and bring out more of the beard. Okay. And you play around. It's very subjective. How much you expose, how much you hide. That's all up to you. Every image is different. And that's why I save each layer as it is. Uh, because I, you, you, you work on it and then you come back a couple of days later and you go and you look at it and you go, you know what? That's just, I don't like the texture on there. I can go back and I can change everything and go back to the layer that I, that I want. So I'm on this layer with, with the mask. So I save this save as and i have it as a black and white layer and then for me i just put in the term rustic you can come up with your own terms uh or in this case actually texture would work better is it a psd file yes yes yeah, so everything that i'm saving is a ps you see right here where it says photoshop that they're all psd and you can see it right afterwards there they're all psd files at this point thanks tom and I save that, and that's a PSD file. That means I can go back and I can work on any of those layers. I haven't lost anything. But once I've got it just like I want it, like right now we're talking, now I go back and I get rid of the PSD. I go to the layers and I flatten the image. And what I do then, and then I save as, then I go here with the format, where it says Photoshop, and I go to JPEG, and it's now a JPEG, and I've saved it as a JPEG, and now I'm I'm it's saved, and just this one layer, so that I can send it out and share it. Now, what I like to do at this point, though, and again, this is just personal preference. If you notice some of the others, there was vignetting around it or fading around it. So I like to do that next. Now that I've flattened it, you can't do that as a PSD. You can't vignette, but you can on a flatten image. So what you do here, what I do is I go back to camera raw. And then what I do is I go to effects and under effects, there's vignetting. Now I can darken it a little bit if I want, or if I want to give it that old fade, I go the other way and there's that fading that the old ones had. And that's what I do. I do a lot of these like that. And then I save that like that. And then that's how, how I save. And then I save that as VIG, vignette. And now that's saved. And I can go back and if I look at that and go, you know what? I don't like that. I'd rather make it dark again. I can go back to that particular file and I can change it and still have the other and lost nothing, uh, which is real important. And that's pretty much it right there is the image. Oh, the very, very last thing that I do is I go to image adjustment and then I go to contrast. And this is what I call pop. I just pop it. And you, I don't, you can't see it too much up on there, but that just brings out the contrast just a tad, or I'll exaggerate it. There, there you can see how I got a little darker. Here's, here's the normal, and then see how that's, that's exaggerated. But I just pop it just a little, and I'm done. That's it. Now I'm going to do it again with another image. Is there any questions at this point? Do you ever make them see to you? I'm going to get to that later. I, I, got, I pulled up some as an example. I'm going to do a sepia for you in a, in a minute. Yeah. Do you make your own textures? Or do you no, I wish I knew how I found this. These were given to me. The two textures I'm sharing with you were given to me years ago. And for 1995, I will give you these for free. 
I, I, my plan is when this is, I'm going to send Kathy or Andrew, I'm going to send you the two textures that I use, and then you're welcome to play with them and use them all you want. Oh, thank you. I, I was going to say that at the end to tell you, but Nan beat me to the punch on that. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, I felt coming up here to share this with you. I was going, I can't tell them my, my secret, my trick, and then just walk away. That's just so cool. Yeah, yeah, so I, I want to share with you what I know, but I also want to share with you what I use. So you're going to get this texture that I use on here and the sepia one that I use on here, okay? Is that okay, man? Did I just become your hero? <laughs> Okay, let's get out of there. Let me pull out another one. Do you want to say, no, let's not. Uh, let's see, I want to pull one more. Oh yeah, here's, here's the other uh, one I, I, I pulled up. This I also took out at Huntington, what, two weeks ago, uh, Abe Lincoln. Going to do the same thing again. Uh, you just can't take a, a colorized picture of Lincoln just doesn't fit the brain. Okay, at least it doesn't fit my brain, okay? I've never seen a colorized photo of Lincoln. You just can't do that, it's okay? It's wrong. W excuse me? It's just inherently wrong. It is inherently wrong, absolutely. So what, what I do, and again, just going through my, my workflow so you get an, uh, an idea here. Uh, first thing that I do is I go into um, camera raw, yeah, work on the basic. I want to make sure the exposures are right. Contrast is good. Bring out the highlights in the background. Here's the shadows important because that's a black coat there. It's important to bring that shadow out there really strong. So I bring that shadow out there like that. And I want to bring in texture and bring out his clarity. And I hit OK. I'm there and I'm in, I'm in Photoshop. Let me see something here real quick. Let me go back. Okay, yeah, and there, and there we are. We go from here to here. Okay, we're ready to work with it in black and white. I go over to black and white. By the way, instead of black and white, you could use Silver Express, uh, um, Silver Nick. Nick, Silver. Nick, the Nick. I had that on, on my computer. And my my 27 inch crashed, and so I had to get this one. And, and now they want me to buy it uh, again, and I'm go, I'm holding off. I bought three times. So yeah, I'm, I'm so I'm <laughs> holding off right now. Uh, yeah. But I used it before the Silver Express. Ex, I FX. never FX Pro, uh, so you can use that. But so but for me the black and white works good as it is here. Oh, another thing you can do instead of that. Um, you can also, if you don't want to use black and white, you can go to saturation and then just take out the saturation completely and you're there. That's the quick way to do it. Uh, bring, out, bring out your hue saturation, grab on your saturation slider, pull it all the way to the left. However, it leaves out some, you cannot control anything. So I like to do it individually. As I say, every photo, I do everything individually on it. So I, I play around with them, you know, like, see, I bring out, I like to bring out that face a little, the yellows, okay, I want to lighten that up, the green there a little bit, the blue, I know I'm going to bring down the cyan and the blue, so I can bring out the, the jacket and the, the magenta works on the face, and I'm pretty much there. And then what I do is I go in and I go to my exposure, I just to the right just a tad to bring it to the left the offset to bring out the richness of the color and then the gamma to the right to bring out the richness again and then i come on into the contrast and pop it there i am there's my black and white uh, so i save that as black and white now this is my own little thing that i do so it's saved and i'm there and i'm ready Okay, and then what I do is I go, and it's already on here. I have my texture on there. I, cop I collect all, I copy it. I go to my image, and I paste it right on top. 
and then as you can see it's too small for this particular image so i do my command t and then oh let me let me try something first here let me oh no no that's not going to work okay command t bring it up i stretch it out i'm holding on the uh, shift key as i move it over See, if you don't hold on the shift key, as you move things, it can see that just goes all at once. That, that time it fits, sometimes it doesn't. If you hold down on the option key, you, it, gets, it can get wonky. So, uh, but anyway, if you hold on the, shift, uh, on, the, on the shift key, you can control the edges, getting it right on the edges, really nice. And I hit enter to make sure it's there. See, it's on its own layer on top. It's so on top of there, like we talked about before. That's when I go to the mask down at the bottom, make sure you're on the layer, it's highlighted. And then you just click on the mask. And then what I do is I lower the opacity so I can see the, where the figure is. And then I make sure that I'm on the brush and I'm on black and 45% is too high. I take it down about 30, 31. Then I play with the brushes. Brush size, you can use your bracket keys left and right, make it bigger and smaller. You don't want to make it too big. If you make it too big like that, you're go, getting on the outside as much as well. So let me go back. So I'm, I just let me get a little larger here. I always start on the face, make sure I got the face. Okay, click a little on the hat. Bring down the exposure just somewhat. Again, this is all subjective. Okay, how much you want, how much you want to do. I rarely play with the background unless there's something back there I want to make sure is in the image. I just kind of click on it, just click, 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 click till I get what I want. Again, very subjective like that okay that looks good i like what i do what i like to do if i can get it is you can see some of the texture scratching you can see it up on the hat which is great see how it crosses into the figure but i don't like to get it on the face that's why i do extra clicking on the face i always keep the face again that's subjective it's up to you as an individual but I find it very distracting. If I brought that line all the way across onto the face, it, it just kind of takes from it. It may be very realistic, but it doesn't preserve the image the way I would like it. Uh, again, it's very subjective. And then I'm, I'm looking at this. And you know, in this particular case, this looks good, but see the face, how bright it is, and the hand, how dark. So what I will do in a case like this is I will go and so now I tell you what, I'll just go with my W here, bring out where there it is. So here we go. What I'm what I just clicked on here is the quick selection tool and bring it up a little here. And what I there, I just captured the, the hand, uh, right click. Feather it, make sure that's at 60, about 30% would be okay. And then what I do here in the adjustment, uh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, I can't do that yet. Okay, never mind. I'll get to that in a few minutes. Okay, I've got that like I want it. It's pretty much like I want. So now I'm going to save that. Oops. I'm going to save that as a texture. All right, now that I've saved it as a texture, I'm going to come on down to the layer and I'm going to flatten it. And now I'm going to save as in Photoshop for the format, I'm going to save it as a JPEG. And now I can play around with it. Now I can go to the hand and I'm going to get on the quick selection. I'm on the quick selection, grab it, make sure right click for your feather. It's at 30%, okay. And then what I do is, you, again, it's all subjective. 
I want to bring it down. You can, uh, the curves is one thing. You could see how you lighten it, but not too much, not too much, just a tad. And so the hand looks much more in line with the, with the face, but not overpowering to distract from the face. Um, so you see the hand there and now the hand. Uh, little things like that, just kind of touching it up. Looks good. I'm going to save it. It looks good like that. Then what I do again is I go back to camera raw and I go to the effects and then I play with the vignetting. Do I want to go with the dark look or do I want to go with the vignette? Again, your choice on that. Uh, again, it's subjective what you want to do. So let's say this time we'll just keep it on the dark side a little bit. That way you see more of the texturing and everything. And you hit OK, and then I save that. And uh, we're, we're good to go. Oh, then my last thing, I, I go to adjustments, brightness, and then I just pop it. Well, that's too dark, but I just want to show you. You can see how I just touch it just a little bit to give it that last touch there. OK. Now, let's switch things up a little bit. Any questions on that? Are they always portrait orientation? Is that how they did it back in the old days? Yeah, I, I've you, noticed all yours are always portrait. Yeah, most of them were, were portraits. You'll see some, but not, uh, the landscape ones tend to be the landscape photos. Like you see photos of Antietam and the battlefields. They'll be landscape. That's where the term came up because so, they were capturing the landscape. But very few, unless there's a group of people. So, like if you were doing the Civil War where there were all the shooters and the cannons, you would, you would so still. They, that, would be a that would be a landscape. Yeah, that would be a landscape, definitely. All right. uh, but when you're doing individual photos, they were all portrait. And that's where we get the terms of portrait in the landscape from, right. is from the subject matter in which they were consistently trying to capture at that time. Uh, the portraitures were, were pretty much what we call portrait size. Definitely. Didn't know, like, did they do family photos in a in a group and they, jam they, them all into a little portrait? Yeah, one that would, yeah, they would go with the landscape oh, with okay. that, or sometimes they would just go with the oval. They would try to capture oh, it all with okay. the oval okay. with the family. I've seen that. Yeah, um, and that's how they would capture four or five in, in an oval shape. And they're never smiling, right? Never smile. Well, the reason for the, you, and you probably know this, Tom, but for those that don't, you will never see a smile in any photo in the 19th century. Bad teeth or? No, and it wasn't for bad teeth. <laughs> that's, that's a good point, the bad teeth. But no, it wasn't for the bad teeth. It was because in the photos back then, they had to stand or sit for 30 seconds, a minute, or two minutes. And it was very difficult to keep smiling for one, keep smiling for one minute. Is, like, you can't do it. But if you just frown, you can stand there and sit there and frown. In fact, what you would do a lot of times, you don't see it in the photos, was they would have a brace in which the head would, like a prong, and they would rest back on that. And that made it easier. And they would get their photos taken just resting back on the prong. And, it, and the face, they would never smile because it was easier to hold that pose for a minute or two minutes, however long they needed to. Oh, I didn't, I learned something, I didn't know that. Yeah, so that's why you will never see a smile. It had, it, it, teeth are a good point, but it was because it was difficult to can, can maintain that pose, that composure uh, for that long, long time. That makes sense. Like that. Uh, <laughs> That, and I'll talk about the prong. Another reason they use the prong, and this is kind of morbid for you, but the, the subject back in the mid 19th century, the number one subject that was photographed more than any other, Kathy knows what I'm going. Go ahead. I was thinking about it when you were talking about the prong. Yeah. And I'm like, I bet they used that when they took their portraits of dead people. Exactly. Uh, there are the subject matter of <laughs> dead people dead people were photographed more than living people yeah. there are more photos of dead people than there are living that was the number one subject that was photographed back in the 19th century and they would put it on the prong as well and just rest there uh especially heartbreaking children because children 
most often did not live into adulthood. And so when the child died of whatever disease or whatever it was, they, for posterity, they wanted to keep the remembrance of the child and they would immediately think, get a photo taken as soon as they die. Something that we today would never even cross our mind uh, was the standard practice back in the 19th century. Uh, so there are tons, of, and we're way off on that. Sorry that in, in Zoom land, we're off on a tangent there, but we're here to learn. So <laughs> and that, again, that's a freebie for you on that, on that one there. So, uh, okay, let's uh, move into a different kind of photo. I'm gonna grab, okay, uh, let me bring up this one here. This one I also took uh, and I picked this one intentionally because it was uh, not a good photo, but I still liked it and salvaged it. And I'll show you how. Um, what I remember what I told you with the two things I looked for cat and a beard, okay? But this guy had also a pipe. Oh, there was no way I was going to let that photo go by. But he was talking and moving, and I just couldn't get him. And I don't like it. When I'm out there photographing, as I said, I like candid photos, and I don't like to interrupt them when they're talking or whatever. I say, oh, excuse me, I'd like to take your photo. That just doesn't make it for me, okay? So he was talking and just going on and on, and I'm capturing the photo. And then I said, after I got home, I, I, and I go through and I call, call him, and, you know, Delete, throw away, and I, and I looked at this one. Hi, mom. Uh, I look. I looked. <laughs> I looked through. Oh, you didn't take it, did you? Yes. Oh no. <laughs> and I stopped doing it. <laughs> so uh, what I do is I call through and delete a lot of them, you know. But I, I want to get different gestures, different looks, and so forth. And I just kind of said, you know what? Let me play around with this, and I like what I came up with on this one. So again, I start with my basic and uh, I, I got with the, the exposure a little bit, a little bit of the contrast, highlight, bring out the shadow. Cause again, dark clothes there, bring out the texture, bring out the clarity. Okay. We're ready to go here. Um, first thing that I did here, we are in, in Photoshop here. First thing I did is I did not like that tilt. I definitely did not like that tilt at all. So I go to my ruler and what I do is for me, I just, okay, that's about where he's at uh, on the line there. I come to image, I go down to image rotation, arbitrary, it's set around 16. So I click on the 16 and this is what it looks like there. I'm going, okay, I've got to crop this as it is. So I go to my crop tool, hold down my shift, and I start working with it a little bit. I'm going, okay, let's bring that in. I got to bring this up. Got to bring this way up here. Uh, how are we doing there? We're doing okay. Let me go up there. I can bring this back out a little. And that looks okay there. So I hit okay. Now I've got I'm these corners here. So what I do is I go to my healing brush here, um, the spot healing brush, and there's several ways of doing it, but I, the, because these are just background, I just go, my spot healing, I just cover it all like that, and boom, it's gone. Spot healing here, and boom, it's almost gone, catch it again. And you just kind of clean up those spaces. And there, there's my image. Much better angle now to work with. Um, so in this case, I'm thinking, I'm not going to do a straight black and white. I like the coloring that's going on here. Uh, but what I'm going to do um, is, first of all, let's see, let me get my layers. OK, let's go in here. And I go into my hue and saturation, and then I go to my reds. And again, I'm just dealing with saturation. I'm going to bring it down a little. We're dealing with an old photo, but I'm not doing black and white. I bring down my red. I go through all six of these. Yeah, six of them in the yellows. 
strong in the back there. So let me bring that down a little bit. The greens, no greens. My cyan there, there's no cyan to play with. The blues, a little bit of blue. So bring the blues in. And then the magenta, which is normally the face. You can see it up there a little bit. Bring that down a little bit. So not much change, but there, there's the image to work with. Uh, so what I do is I save this. First of all, I'll make it a 12 inch. And then I save as, let's see, this was the Civil War. And I just brought the colors down a little bit. So for my own sake, I just call it semi. All right, and let's bring this up a little here. I've got the semi there. I'm going, okay, this is what I'm dealing with here. Um, I said, now, instead of bringing in that other texture, let me bring in the sepia-based texture that I have. That's this one right here. This is my second bread and butter one, man, the other one that you're going to get. So what I do on this one, I copy it, and I, I, I capture all of it, copy it, and then I come over to this one, and I paste it right over there. And I'm going, okay, Command T. So I then what I do is I shift it around, get it at 90%, there we are, 90 degrees. Oops, it was 90. 90, that's pretty close right there. Okay, we're at 90 degrees. Hold down the shift to make sure I get my borders on there. And I put my borders on there. Okay, it's on there. I hit enter. Again, just like we did before, I go over here and I've got it highlighted and I hit the uh, mask and I make sure I'm on brush, B for brush. It's on black. Yeah, I'm at 25. Let's get again up to around 30 or so. Now, where is the image? Let me find it. I bring the opacity down. Come down further on here. Okay. And then I start playing around a little bit. And I just start bringing this out, bringing this out, and I'm clicking on it. Clicking, clicking, clicking. And I'm clicking. I want to make sure I get that pipe. And I'm cli clicking on, on more of this. So you just kind of click. Make sure you got some of it. I've got all of it. Then I bring my opacity back up, way up. And you're going, oh, I got a lot of more to work on there. So I work on that. Bring out like what you want. Takes a few minutes to bring out what you want. Now, in this case, again, everything is so. Now, I don't know if the here, I don't know if the shoulder continues and it's covered. So I, what I do is I, I turn it off. Ah, and then I turn it back on. Yes, there's some shoulder over there. Okay, make sure I've got it. And you're clicking on there, you're capturing it. Now, in this particular case, this is kind of strong. So what I do is I click on that sepia. I go over to the image. I go over to the adjustments. I go down to hue and saturation, and then I desaturate it a little. I bring it down. You can go all the way down for a gray effect, and that sometimes works, but I'm going to keep it a little bit with the sepia here. And then I click OK, and I'm working on it. Oh, and then you want to be that. See, that's a mistake that I make sometimes. I forget you're on, on the sepia. You don't want to take from the sepia. It doesn't take as well. You've got to click back on the, um, the um, mask. mask. Thank you. Click on the mask, and that's where you take it from. And you get all of that off of there. Now, as I said before, once you've got what you want, see how that's all white up there? You got to bring some of that back. So you put it in, and I kick up the opacity when I do that. Let's come on in. 
And what you do is you bring that, that texture back in. Now, me personally, I don't mind going in on the subject a little bit. It sometimes adds to the uh, roughness of the overall image. Bring it up there, but sometimes that's a little too much. So I'll go back. Again, you're just playing around and just coming up with what you feel good with. Okay. So I got something like this. Now, I'm pretty much done here. And this is, looks okay. And again, it's pretty subjective. So I'll save this and call it sepia. Again, that's just me. Now I'll, I'll flatten it so I can play with it now. And, but I gotta save it first. Make sure you're in photo, you save it as a JPEG. And now I can fool around with it a little bit. This is still too colorized for me. So what I'll do is I'll go in to the hue, and again, I'll desaturate it a little bit. Now I could go all the way like that and bring it into a black and white effect. I want to keep a little color in this one. So I got that there like that. Then I will go and Go to the camera raw. And in this case, what I'll do with the effects with the vignetting, instead of lightening it, I will go and darken it. I like for the, when I'm dealing with the sepia, it really brings out the darkness here. I hit OK. And then this is where you come back in on that exposure and you lighten that up a little. And then you bring that offset. See how that brings out that rich makes it nice and rich there. And then you've got a nice image like that. Now that might be a little too rich. So you might want to grab uh, your uh, quick selection, capture some of that real dark area. Again, just playing around with it. That real dark area there. Then what I do is I go to my camera raw and that area there, I go back and I, and I look at the shadow, bring out a little bit, bring that shadow out and hit okay. And I get rid of that and you can see the difference a little bit there with the history. You can see how dark it is and then how it's lightened up a little bit like that. And you can play around with different areas. And so, you know, I go from the original image that I had to this, this baby right here. Uh, and, and so this is a whole different effect. Now, what I like to do with these sepia ones is I like to put a little frame around these. I have a little special frame that I, I helped develop. One I was taught with and then I added to it. This is what I do. Once I've got this image like this, to give it more of an appeal, I go back to the sepia, because this one is now um, 12 inches. So I go back to the sepia, and it's about 12 inches on that. So I would need to make that larger. I'm going to make this 300. And I make it 18 inches. All right, that's 18 inches. Then I go back, I take this one, I capture all of it, capture it, put it on here, and then I put it on there, but I'm gonna take Command T, whoops. Let me go back, let me go back here. I'm gonna do that all over again. So let me start over. I've got the sepia, it's at 18. I need to rotate it. Rotate that 90 degrees. Now I go back to this one, capture it, come back to the sepia base and put that bad boy in there. Now, I take that and let's say I just bring that in. Oh, you gotta hold down the 
option. Hold down the option as you move it in and it, see how that does that uniformly like that? I, I get where I want it, okay? And then I hit the crop tool on the outside and what I do is I bring in this side to measure out. See how I have that now framed? And I hit enter, you see that? And then I make a copy of that, Command J. All right, I've made a copy of this, okay? What I then do is I go on over here to the rectangle. You have the, the rectangle marquee and the elliptical. I go to the rectangle. I put, I capture that and we're on the top layer over here. I then go to the fill box and I fill it with black 100% like that. Then I get rid of the marching ants, which is your um, command D. I then go over to the filter here. I go to the Gaussian blur and I keep it at about 150. See how it then spills out over here. I hit OK. I then move that down a layer and now that spill is on the outside and I go, you know, I want to make it a little stronger. So I go back up here to the stroke. So on black, I hit OK, and look, it's even darker. That may be a little too dark. So you go over to the opacity, and you bring it down to what you want. Okay, let's just keep it at 90. Then I hit the layer, and I flatten it. That's pretty good there. I, that's a nice little technique on there. But you might want a little freebie here is then you go back to the, uh, what you do is capture the whole thing. You hit the command A, capture the whole thing. You come back up to the stroke. You make, well, at this time it's at 30. You want it on the outside. And let's say you want the color to be like, this, yeah, make a little darker, you hit OK, you hit OK. Let's see if that shows up. It doesn't show up too much. Let's do it again. I'm going to, I'm going to, let's see, Command A, come up, stroke, let's make it 70 pixels. Well, great. Put on the outside. Yeah, I think it might have to be on the inside to capture it. You're right. Yeah, that captured it. There we go. But I, I, that's a little light. I want to go and catch, I want to get it stroke, I want it darker. Hit OK, hit OK. There we go. That's a little too thick. But you get the idea stroke. Uh, let's say 40. Something like that. You can do something like that. Or if you don't like that, there's something else you can do. Um, let's see if I can. Where is it? Maybe I. I'm looking for, let's see, not filters. No, okay. I'll save it for another time. Oh, well. Use, but all right. But anyway, that gives you an idea. Uh, okay, so let's. So you see how this one turned out. Let's let's do another one, one more here, so you get an idea. Um, oh yeah, I, I know what I wanted to do with this one here. I want to share with you this one here. Let's uh, get rid of this. This was another one that I took. Um, at the Civil War, this guy here. Now, the reason I want to share this one with you is another little technique that I do with the black and white. If you look at this guy, ah, look at those eyes. I highlighted them a little bit. You can see how blue they are. What you can do to make sure that they 
blue all the way around, you know, you can you can make a layer, uh, make a layer, and you can go up to to your own brush, and then your mode up there, go down to color. And in this case, with the brush, I wanna. I want to bring out that blue. So let's say just kind of let's say pick, bring out that blue a little more. And so what I do, you can go in here. This is why I like the navigator. You come on in here with the brush from my 55%, and you can put in, look at that. I'm putting in even more blue. See that? That's really blue there now. Love that. Okay. And then I flatten that. Then what I do in this case, once I've gone ahead and I've gone into camera raw and cleaned it all up like this, what I do is I go on over here to my lasso and I feather it at zero. I capture that eye, I hold down the shift and I capture that eye. I've got both those eyes captured. Then I go to inverse, select inverse. And now I go to my black and white. <laughs> what? <laughs> just, I'm laughing. Just... Oh, okay. It's, um, it's to, little... to make everything black and white except the eye. Yes. Yeah, and there's a, and that's what I wanted to show you because it pops a little bit. Let's uh, uh, what I want to do here now. I've captured this, and then I do my exposure a little bit, a little bit there. Bring out that darkness there, and there you have it like that. Um, and then you got the black and white with those eyes, really piercing blue there, which is pretty neat. But we're, of course, we're not done. We're gonna bring in the uh, uh, texture. And what we're going to do is we're going to copy it. We're going to come on in here and lay it over there like we've done before. It's on top there. We do the Command T. We hold down the Shift. We make sure we've got it captured like we want. Hit Enter. We come down, we get our mask, we bring our opacity down to some degree, then we hit our brush, make sure it's on black, make sure it's around 30 or so. Then what we do is we go ahead, like we've done before, we capture what we want. Now, this is pretty neat. Now, now it looks a little eerie, and I did this on purpose. Those eyes are kind of weird. But this, okay, you get what you like and go, okay, this looks, okay, I've got what I want on here. I'm saving, I'm doing this kind of fast. I'm sorry, because we've done this several times. And I've gone to layer and I flatten the layer. Now what I do is I come in here to the hue saturation and I just bring down, I can bring it all the way and you'll lose the blue all together but I just leave a little bit of the blue, just a little bit. You don't wanna keep all the blue. That just looks too freaky, okay? But if you just keep a little, you know, play it down a little, you get just a tad of blue in there and I hit okay. What it does, I have noticed on a number of images, people look at it and they go, I don't know what it is, but it looks kind of ripped. The eyes kind of look at you. What you've done is you brought the eyes alive without them being too distracting. Okay. And it's just a little smidge. You keep a little bit of the color in there. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that, uh, do, 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 oh, it's not there. Okay. Is I had done the same thing with the uh, Washington in this when we saw that one of Washington. I left a little blue in the eye there kind of pierces out at you. So he looks like he's piercing out at you, but you don't know why. Okay? And it brings it alive a little bit. 
So I wanted to share that with you as well. Just a, just a, a little one there. So, okay. Those were the ones that I wanted to share. Those are examples of using the sepia uh, or what you can do in a, in a situation like this. Uh, if you say, you know what? I, I don't want the black and white. I want, I, want it, I want this sepia. Very simple. All you have to do is go over to your image. You go over to hue saturation. Okay, you see hue saturation there? Over here in this little corner where it says colorize, just click on that. And what you do is you move the hue over, see it turn brown there? And then the saturation, it's a little strong. You bring that, that in a little bit and you just kind of play with it. And there's your, there's your sepia right there very simple and then what i do always brightness i get and i pop it just a little bit and you've got your sepia right there you can do that with any black and white here let me bring up uh this black and white like we did here you go okay there's the black and white but what would it look like if it was sepia go over to adjustments you go image adjustments hue saturation Go over to colorize, bring it over. Bring it over to where you feel good with it. And there it is. You can have it black and white. You can have it sepia. I've been fooling with presets to do that, so I'm very excited to know that this is easier. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure to share that with you then, yeah. Very simple, just hit, all you gotta do is just hit that colorize button and then just bring it over, your hue, and then your, then your uh, saturation. However you feel, again, it's all very subjective. You can even play with the lightness and the darkness if you want. Or just keep it black and white. Okay, that's, that's, it's pretty ask, much it, unless there are any more uh, questions. Yeah, ask a question, you guys. Anybody online have questions? Are they still awake? Yeah. <laughs> no, we're in Mala. <laughs> <laughs> As I said before, I'll send to Andrew and Kathy, I'll send the two textures. I'll send the black and white texture and the sepia texture so that you can then play with it. What I didn't do is I didn't turn them around, but you can just turn them around so you get different angles on the same texture. And you, can, I use these on every photo that I take, but I do each one individually so that they each one looks different. Uh, so. Jeff, Andrew says, thank you, John. I'm sorry, I came in late. He can watch the- uh, <laughs> We the, videoed it, Andrew, so you can watch. We actually recorded this one. Just for you, Andrew, because we knew you're gallivanting around in Utah or wherever you are now. <laughs> okay, so let me. Uh, that Kathy, out. where are you going to put that video? I will. Off? I'll put it on our YouTube channel. YouTube? Uh, yeah. Oh. We have an LPA. Have yes, we have an LPA YouTube channel. <laughs> How do I find it? Uh, if you just search for Lancaster Photography Association, it should oh. come up. Or Lancaster Photo Association. I'll send you something. Okay. Um, and if you have any questions, once you get these textures and you're working on them and you, and you get stuck, contact me, okay? Um, Kathy's got my email. Andrew's got my email. Um, I can put it up here uh, if you want to copy it. Uh, let me just get a new blank page. Put more in there we go. There also, it is. Uh, uh oh. Don't do that. Do you have it the chosen person pose or take them without them knowing? I like to do them without them knowing. So many of can. them actually look posed though. But yeah, they're, they're some just, of them will. Once they see the camera, a lot of them will stop and pose, right. definitely. Um, here's, here's my email here John E. Powers. Don't forget the E. A lot of people will write John Powers at hotmail.com. 
and I never see it, never get it. I wrote to whoever John Powers at hotmail.com is and said, hey, if you get anything that looks weird, send it. Never heard from them, never hear from them. So I don't know who got it. So, uh, but here it is. Don't forget the E, John E. Powers at hotmail.com. Just email me. Say, hey, John, I'm stuck. Or what would you suggest? Or here's what I've done. Any recommendations? I'll be glad to be of help to you if I can, by all means. Uh, the way I look at it, we're all in this together. And so we're here to help each other and to do, to do good. So, okay. Okay. Um, well, we have an alarm going off people on Zoom. We had somebody pushed the emergency exit door. <laughs> Yay! What? And we only pizza Oh, was it? Was yeah. it pizza? Yeah. Oh, no. You tell us to get off the email. Anyway, um, thank you all for being here. If it doesn't really, if you like questions, ask uh, email us And, uh, um, well, let's just close this up. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, he's still here. We need to take, instead of taking everything down. So um, I'm sure he'll answer any questions you have. Thank you, John. That well. was a great yeah. workshop. Oh, thank you. Yes. Oh, okay. Let me read everybody. Oh, Andrew says hi now. <laughs> Hi, Nan. There you go, Nan. <laughs> You're a celebrity. <laughs> Andrew said he's a sniper, Helen. He tries to get cameras. What did you say? He's a sniper. John, he just tries to get cameras, not have people post. Helen was asking if he got them to pose for him or if he did it sneaky. Yes. If I do have them pose, if they do say, I just tell them look to the left, look to the right, or something like that. <laughs> Uh, don't look at the camera if you can help don't it. Smile. Yeah, don't smile. <laughs> yeah. 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 You just can't smile. Thanks all so much for being here. I got a ton of images I can play with this with. So Good. Excellent. Ren Fair. Yes, exactly. Stuff. I do them with the Ren Fair, the Pirate Festivals, yeah. the Revolutionary yeah. War, Civil War. It, it, it's, I've been going to all of these since the pandemic. This weekend was Southern California Ren Fair. Okay. Um, thank you all. We'll close with that. Um, and